Welcome to ECE CS 252, Introduction to Computer Engineering, Lecture on Engineering Ethics. What do we mean when we refer to engineering ethics? Well, ethics, speaking broadly, has to do with the issues of right and wrong, sometimes referred to as morality. This is obviously, in the general case, a very broad, complex, and personal topic. This course is not the time or the place uh, to deal with broader issues of ethics or morality. Um, I'm happy to discuss this one-on-one -on -one with any of you offline, uh, but that won't be happening in this setting. Rather, in this setting, we'll be focusing specifically on ethics in the context of engineering. So right and wrong with respect to engineering practice. And the purpose of this unit is to help you become a little bit more aware of this issue and help you provide you with some tools and with some thought processes that you can apply in order to make better professional decisions and actions in situations where ethical considerations come into play. These can have direct effects on many things, for example, safety and well-being of others if you're designing equipment or, or uh, structures or anything of that sort uh, that can be safety critical. There can also be legal consequences or judicial consequences if, if you uh, do things that perhaps aren't uh, don't quite fall within the realm of legal behavior and so you might end up having liability for those. Oftentimes those kinds of issues also have uh, ethical dimensions to them. And there can also be indirect effects. For example, um, doing the ethical thing may sometimes affect the profitability of your employer. It may affect stockholders in terms of the kinds of returns they're expecting on their investments. Um, and it might even affect your financial security. Uh, so engineering ethics is a very uh, important area that uh, traditionally has not really been treated very well or perhaps even at all in engineering curricula. And so we try to do uh, a little bit more of that these days and we have for that reason a, a brief one week unit on this topic in this course. Uh, you should be aware that um, what's considered ethical and what's considered legal are not necessarily um, exactly the same thing. Uh, it's clear that in many cases the set of actions that we would consider to be ethical are a strict subset of the things that we would consider to be legal, uh, but that's actually not sometimes the case. Sometimes there are things that we would consider to be ethical based on our own personal standards that might actually fall outside the realm of legal activities. Uh, it is especially in this domain when we're dealing with things that perhaps um, fall into the space of actions uh, that we might undertake that we would consider to be ethical, but the legal system probably would consider to be illegal, that we have to be very, very careful uh, in making sure that we do things and consider the consequences of our actions before we pursue them. So we'll talk about a few, uh, a few ways to do that, a few ways to, a few tools that we can use to help us make better decisions within this context. One of the things we can really think about is, you know, why is this even important? You know, who cares? We're engineers. We design things. We build things. Uh, are there really any uh, ethics, ethical issues at, at play? Uh, the short answer to that is yes, there are. Uh, you will uh, inevitably encounter scenarios and situations in your professional career as an engineer um, or as a computer scientist that will require you to consider some of the issues that we'll be talking about in this lecture. Uh, so here's a list of five reasons why you may want to think about studying engineering ethics and spending a little bit of time um, dwelling on this issue and perhaps being a little bit introspective and, and um, trying to think a little bit about what it is that makes you make the decisions that you personally make. Uh, what, are the, what are the ethical principles and so on that you, you apply in your own life? So uh, the first reason here. Uh, first reason to study engineering and ethics would be to stimulate the moral imagination. So uh, if you've never done this, it's useful uh, to be able to do this, to basically do some role playing, to create what if kinds of scenarios in your head that says, what if it was me in that situation? Um, what if um, I was actually on the receiving end of this action that I'm about to perform that may or may not have ethical implications and repercussions, um, and to develop sort of a sense of empathy uh, for the situations that others might find themselves in. Uh, second reason would be to help you recognize ethical situations so that you'll recognize and, and be aware that um, you've now entered into the realm uh, of decision making where ethics come into play and you should probably be quite deliberate and careful about uh, the path that you choose to follow. Uh, whereas most of the time, truthfully, probably the vast majority of the time in our engineering work, uh, we don't have to uh, grapple with difficult ethical uh, ethical issues.
Uh, the third reason to do uh, to spend a little bit of time studying engineering ethics would be to develop some analytical skills and we'll talk about a few of those tools that will help you work through some of the gray areas. Fourth reason would be to elicit a sense of responsibility. Oftentimes the, the, uh, the easiest response to an ethical quandary is to pass the buck, is to say, well, it's not my problem. My manager or my manager's manager or the CEO of my company or whoever has already made the decision um, to do this or to not do this, and um, I'm just going to do what I'm told and be a good foot soldier. And uh, that's not always the right response, um, even if ultimately the action that you decide to pursue falls in line with that reasoning. Uh, it's still uh, the right thing to do to have a personal sense of responsibility with regard to personal actions as well as corporate actions um, by your employer uh, so that so that you are not just being a good foot soldier but you are standing up for the things that you need to stand up for when they become important enough to stand up for them. So uh, that's, a, that's a good reason is to just develop an awareness and a sense of responsibility for some of these issues as they come into play. And finally, um, just studying this issue and understanding that there are many different uh, perspectives that people can have um, will help you develop a tolerance for disagreement and ambiguity. Not everything is black and white. There are topics and areas in which reasonable people can differ, and spending a little bit of time thinking about this and understanding this whole problem uh, will make you feel more comfortable with that idea. Because sometimes people just don't feel comfortable with the idea that, that uh, the opposing viewpoint on a particular topic can actually be reasonable. One of the key concepts in the understanding of ethical situations is to try to differentiate between what in that scenario is a fact, what is factual, what in that scenario is conceptual, and so largely a matter of definition and agreement, and what is in, what is in turn ethical. So we want to try to identify um, aspects of the scenario that we're considering or the, the situation that we're faced with that fall into these three categories so that we can isolate the ones that really are just a matter of our uh, ethics and we can focus on those rather than on the factual and conceptual issues. So uh, we'll do that, do this analysis in the context of an example scenario. So let's say an employee moves from a company, one company A to another company B, um, but as part of their employment with the first company, they've agreed not to disclose any proprietary information. This is a pretty standard thing that uh, companies will make you do. Anything that you learn while on the job there uh, has to stay there. You can't take it with you to the next job and, and uh, apply it there. However, uh, this employee in this situation finds a new way to apply the technique that she learned at company A uh, at company B. This will help company B build better, safer products, and it really will have no effect on A because they're not really competing with each other. She's moved from a, one industry to a different industry um, and a different line of business, and so uh, there really is no uh, there really is no issue of giving company B an unfair advantage against company A since the two companies don't actually compete with each other. So the question is, the ethical quandary is, should she disclose the technique to B? So there's many issues at play here. We'll focus, first of all, on the factual issues. So what are the issues in this scenario that are factual? Uh, by factual, we mean they're facts. They're clearly true or false. Um, the, real on the only real fact here is that um, applying this technique will lead to a better, safer product. There's no question about that. There's no doubt about that. Uh, however, just because it was easy in this case to figure out what the facts were, that's not always going to be the case. Depending on the scenario, facts can be difficult to ascertain. Uh, they might be historical facts, there might be different people involved who might have different recollections of what happened, uh, so there might be some uncertainty there. Uh, but in general, it's the case that these factual issues should be things that we can extract out um, fairly unambiguously, and we can usually resolve them by further investigation or by doing some empirical research uh, to uh, validate or verify uh, any any assertions in the scenario. So these are the things that are that we as uh, engineers and as mathematicians and as scientists should be pretty comfortable with uh, trying to get to the bottom of the of the factual issues in a scenario like this. The next category is really the conceptual issues. 
So again, uh, conceptual issues are really, you can think of them as they're a matter of definition. So in this particular instance, we have the phrase proprietary information, which appears in the employment contract that this employee had signed at the first employer, company A. So the question really becomes then, what does proprietary information mean? If the information that she acquired while she was at company A um, is something that she perhaps could have picked up by taking another course somewhere, or perhaps could have picked up by doing uh, some literature search, is it truly proprietary? Probably not. So proprietary would have to mean something that's normally called a trade secret for the company that really isn't known anywhere else and could not be discovered anywhere else. So there has to be some kind of definition of what it is that we mean by this proprietary information. Furthermore, we have to have some understanding of what the use of proprietary information really means. What constitutes use of proprietary information? Um, I think in this case it's pretty clear applying that information to the development of a different product, development of a different company, would probably be a reasonable definition uh, of use of proprietary information. <clears throat> in general, these conceptual issues uh, have to be uh, have to be unearthed or have to be agreed upon by everyone involved. So there has to be some kind of consensus, uh, whether it's a true consensus or whether it's one that's uh, imposed through a, a trial process by a, a judge or a jury. Um, it's kind of dependent on the scenario, but it, has, it is unfortunately the case that quite often lawyers and judges and courts will get involved to help establish uh, these conceptual issues in these scenarios if they actually escalate to the point where uh, where um, the two companies in question will go to court uh, over the over the events that have transpired. The final category then is pretty much what's left over. So these are the ethical issues. So what are the issues at play in this scenario that are ethical or, or moral? Uh, well, anything that's moral or ethical is really a matter of principles. So given some set of ethical principles that a particular individual uh, desires to adhere to, um, <clears throat> the question really then becomes which of these moral principles are relevant to the case at hand. So in this particular case, um, the moral principle is really theft. Uh, so is it okay to effectively steal intellectual property from one company and, and uh, hand it over to another company? It's pretty straightforward in this case, but again, quite often there's more than one um, moral or ethical principle that comes into play. For example, we could um, expand on the scenario and say, what if it's the case that the product that B manufactures is actually failing in a life-threatening way without this technique? So actually the end users, perhaps it's a medical device, uh, the patients are actually <clears throat> at risk of life because of this deficiency in the product and now this employee really knows how to improve the product um, as a result of this proprietary information she picked up in another company, how does that change this scenario? And it does change it dramatically because another ethical principle comes into play. Uh, many of us would like to think that there's an ethical principle that could be summarized as doing no harm. We should do whatever we can uh, to um, create products and so on that uh, will not harm their users uh, to the extent that that's possible. So we have a doing no harm ethical principle and we have a theft principle and the two of them now conflict. And in order to resolve this question, we would now have to somehow weigh these two principles against each other, weigh the relative effects of violating one of them um, against the benefits um, with respect to the other one. And we'd somehow have to juggle these priorities now, these ethical priorities and reach a, reach a conclusion. So we'll talk a little bit about some ways to to help us work our way through that reasoning process. Before we do that though, let's talk a little bit about what moral and ethical principles are in general. Obviously these, these are something that are going to vary widely across individuals um, and across cultures. And ultimately there's something you have to decide for yourself. It's part of the process of growing up and becoming an adult uh, is to basically look around and uh, examine the ethical and moral principles that you've been exposed to through your childhood and decide which ones are the ones that you're going to choose to apply uh, to your own life or to, or to try to follow in your own life. Now the only advice I can give you here is uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, humans have been living in, in organized structured societies for thousands of years. 
and um, the moral and ethical principles that have been well established in those in those organized societies are, are there for a reason and it's generally not a good idea to throw everything out and start over but a much better idea to just carefully examine the set of principles that that you see perhaps your parents or your relatives living by uh, and your peers and then decide whether those are the ones um, that you also want to adopt. One area in which we want to be particularly careful here though is um, any uh, principles where there are conflicts between what you might view as ethical uh, versus what might actually be legal in the country that you're living in. So there may be actions and things that you may think are, you may think are ethical uh, but your employer is going to be constrained to doing what's legal. And so you have to be very careful about engaging in any activity that you might consider as ethical, um, again, in your professional capacity, but that your employer would possibly disagree with um, because of the law of the land. And you have to realize that there will be repercussions for that. Your employer is not going to respond positively uh, to you doing things that are illegal, uh, independent of what your ethical view of those actions may or may not be. So, okay, what are some possible starting points for building up a set of moral or, moral or ethical principles that you might choose to apply in your professional life? Well, you can start in the political realm, um, maybe with the Bill of Rights and the U.S. Constitution. You could start in the religious realm, maybe the Ten Commandments or even something simpler, the Golden Rule. Uh, or maybe in the judici judicial realm, uh, you can look at something like uh, English common law, which dates back hundreds of years and has established uh, many traditions and, and legal precedents uh, uh, governing the interactions and the rights and the responsibilities of citizens. Again, this is a very broad, uh, broad topical area and we're not really going to dig too much deeper into what particular moral or ethical principles uh, you might choose to have. Uh, rather, we're, we're going to stick, uh, stick more on the analytical side and pre present you with some tools and some examples to help you, um, help you along in the process of thinking about this, rather than trying to lead you to any particular correct answer uh, in this domain. Okay, going back to the context of our earlier example. Once you have identified a moral or ethical rule or principle that you feel is relevant, that is potentially being uh, violated in the particular scenario that you're uh, trying, to, trying to resolve, uh, it can be useful to try to create a continuum of analogous situations. So try to create a, a set of uh, situations that um, range from clear and obvious violations of that principle at one, ex one, at one end, so these would be the, the first few on the list here, versus ones that are you know, progressively more ambiguous until you finally get to cases where, yeah, you might see that somebody would view this as being a violation of this ethical principle but definitely you know most people would probably say oh who cares you know that's no big deal uh, so just picking a few from this list which i encourage you to read in more detail you know obviously at the top of the list if i break into a store and i steal three thousand dollars in merchandise um, i don't think there are too many people that would disagree with the statement that um, or would disagree or would disagree with the fact that this is a violation of um, a moral principle that says we should not steal or commit theft. Um, you know, the second one here, borrowing somebody's car and failing to return it, that's also pretty obviously uh, in violation of that ethical principle. But if we go further down and get to kind of the other end, number 10 here, if you pick up a quarter that you find on the street, well, that's probably, you wouldn't find too many people that would try to stay that, say that that's actually stealing. Uh, and as you go up to nine here, failing to return a sheet of paper or paper clip you borrowed, okay, that's such an inexpensive item that it really sort of falls into the falls into a gray area. Um, number eight, if you pick up a quarter but you actually saw the person drop it, well now it gets a little iffy, right? Should you actually chase that person down and return their quarter to them, or is a quarter such a small amount of money that again, it's really sort of nonsense to to do that. So you create this kind of continuum of analogous situations, and then you actually try to place the uh, situation that you're facing into this continuum, and that gives you a sense of how black and white, how clear is it, how clear is the situation versus um, how much ambiguity is there, and how much, uh, how much sort of, how 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 much are you into the gray areas of this ethical principle? So in this particular ex ex example, um, uh, we put. The, the example that we were talking about, using some ideas you developed as company A for a very different uh, process, 
at company B in, in the middle here at about number six. So it's a sort of, you know, closer perhaps to the end of end of this end of the continuum where we most people would think it's probably okay and a little bit further from the end where most people would unambiguously declare that it's it's a violation of this ethical principle against stealing. So again, this is really not an algorithm that will give you an absolute definitive answer as to whether what you're doing is a violation of that um, ethical principle. Rather, it's a way to help you think about it in a little bit more depth and to generate some sort of introspective thoughts that will perhaps lead you uh, to a more well-informed and more likely uh, to a decision that will you'll more likely be comfortable with in the long run. One example that can be helpful here is to go through an actual code of ethics that's been created by uh, the IEEE or the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Uh, IEEE is an, is an organization that I belong to. It's the professional organization for double E's, computer engineers and computer science professionals. Um, and just a few years ago, in February 2006, they actually uh, assembled a committee and uh, sat down and decided to create a code of ethics uh, for our profession. Now, this <clears throat> code of ethics in and of itself is, is not something that's, in my view, particularly good. It's kind of a, a jumble of concepts and philosophies and suggestions and so on. Um, it's not, it's perhaps not the, not the greatest example, but it does uh, touch on a, a bunch of areas that are, that are relevant and important. So it's worth going through. So let's go through this. So the first one says to accept responsibility in making decisions consistent with the safety, health, and welfare of the public, and to disclose, disclose promptly factors that might endanger the public or the environment. So this is specifically having to do with engineers who are designing products that could have an impact on safety, health, welfare, and could potentially endanger the public. And the Code of Ethics just calls for behavior that will um, minimize these safety impacts and will uh, disclose factors that might lead to dangerous situations. Fairly straightforward, obvious stuff. The second one here is to avoid real or perceived conflicts of interest wherever possible and to disclose them. So conflicts of interest are uh, usually the kind of situation is where let's say you are responsible for making a purchasing decision uh, with respect to uh, components that you're going to use for a particular uh, engineer design that you're working on and um, you decide to purchase components from a company that you have an ownership interest in or perhaps is owned by a family member. So you're basically going to steer uh, your company's business to another company that you also have a financial interest in. That's an example of a conflict of interest. Um, so these are something that um, come up quite often and are something that you have to deal with honestly. Um, so again, avoid real, avoid them if possible, um, and if they do exist and you really can't avoid them because let's say truly the best product that you can use in your own engineer design comes from an entity or a company that you have a conflict of interest with, well, if that's the case, then uh, just make sure to disclose that and, and put it out in the, in the open so that this isn't something that will uh, be discovered later and you'll be accused of, of doing something dishonest much later. It's much, much better. The right thing to do is to make sure that this is all publicly disclosed up front to all the affected parties. Third clause of the IEEE Code of Ethics then calls us to be honest and realistic in stating claims or estimates based on available data. So one of the big jobs that we as engineers will do is we will be asked to estimate um, or make claims about particular attributes or features of products. And there's often a temptation to um, oversell things, to basically claim that this new processor I'm designing is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, it's going to be twice as fast or use one-tenth the power or whatever the metric might be relative to um, its competition. And so the IEEE Code of Ethics simply calls for us as engineers to always be honest and realistic in making any claims or estimates. The fourth one is also fairly straightforward. We should reject bribery in all its forms. So if someone offers you uh, compensation in order to influence a decision, again, this is similar to the conflict of interest situation, but this is an explicit case where someone is actually offering you money to steer your decision in a particular direction. Uh, that's something that we should always reject. Fifth, we should uh, seek to improve the understanding of technology 
and its appropriate application and potential consequences. So this is sort of a civic clause here that says it's part of our civic responsibility to help uh, others in society who may not have the technical background or the uh, understanding of a particular technology that we have, we should, we're, we're responsible, we're on the hook to help people understand. Um, you know, we should be willing to, to stand up in the marketplace of ideas and educate people and help them understand that uh, a particular technology, what its advantages and disadvantages might be in, in an honest fashion, so that decisions that others make, especially uh, decisions that politicians might make, would be well-informed decisions rather than, rather than uh, poorly informed ones. The sixth clause then calls us to maintain and improve our technical competence and to undertake technological tasks only if we're qualified by training or experience, or again, after full disclosure of any limitations. So this really has to do with the fact that sometimes we'll be asked to work on things um, or design things that we really aren't qualified to work on or design. So first of all, we should make sure we maintain our technical com competence so that as things change in our industry, we don't fall behind. We don't just cling to the things that we learned you know, 20 years ago when we were undergraduates, but we continually educate ourselves so that we remain competent and up to date. And then again, when we're asked to work on a particular project, we have to make sure that uh, we actually have the skills in the background to um, undertake that task. We are actually qualified for it. Or if whoever is insisting that we do this continues to insist, we at least fully disclose our limitations on that front. The seventh clause here then is really uh, about providing honest feedback or honest criticism, both to accept it and to offer it to others so that when we're asked to review the work of others or when others are reviewing our work, we will um, honestly acknowledge any errors and correct any errors and we will also credit properly the contributions of others. So if there were six of us that worked on a particular project, uh, I shouldn't run off and claim all the credit. Um, I should fairly allocate credit and acknowledge others' contributions. This is again something that um, the Code of Ethics calls us to, but that quite often, even in my own personal uh, career, I've seen violations of, of this particular issue more than once. The eighth clause is really a non-discrimination clause that we should treat fairly all persons regardless of their race, religion, gender, disability, age, or national origin. Uh, this is pretty standard. Um, if you go to work for a big company like uh, IBM, which is where I worked for a number of years before I came here, uh, this is something that um, is very important and is um, was drilled into me over and over again. This is a fire, firing offense. If uh, in, in your professional work you're found to discriminate, against anyone um, on, on any of these bases, you're probably going to lose your job. And you should. This is not something that uh, any reasonable person, person in this day and age should, should engage in. Um, number nine here is really, again, coming back to, to honesty, but more on the malicious front. So we should never do things that will injure others, their property, their reputation, or their employment. Um, by false or malicious action. So this again would be misrepresenting others and their actions um, in a context where that misre misrepresentation will again affect any of these things. It's pretty pretty straightforward basically. Do, do no harm. Um, and the final clause here is again to be collegial. We should be willing to assist colleagues and co-workers in their professional development. So if I happen to have developed an expertise in a particular subject area, I should be willing to share that expertise with my professional colleagues um, so that they might better themselves as well. And finally, we should apply this in the context of following this code of ethics as well. So if we see that someone is doing something uh, in response to uh, this code of ethics, we really should be willing to stand behind them. So the common example of this would be if, if someone in our workplace uh, discovers something that uh, isn't quite right, isn't quite kosher, and decides to be what's called a whistleblower. They decide to um, identify this publicly and sort of make a federal case out of it. Uh, we should be willing to support them in that task. We should be willing to stand up for them and say they're doing the right thing and uh, put our own, basically put our own careers on the line as well in support of others who are behaving in an, in an ethical manner.
Okay, so that's the IEEE Code of Ethics. Uh, again, it's kind of a mishmash of, of suggestions and principles and so on, but it, it gives you something to, something to chew on, something to think about. It's a concrete example of a Code of Ethics that, that my particular um, professional society has adopted. Some other things that might be useful, uh, some of the rules and tools that might be useful um, are listed on this slide. Um, I think a, a really important one is on the top here, it's the principle of informed consent. And this basically derives from the argument that um, you can assume that people who are adults, so if we're dealing with adults, if we're dealing with children, um, that's a whole other thing, but assuming that you're dealing with adults, um, you should assume that they will act in their own best interest. And they'll act in their own best interest, of course, if, um, if they have full disclosure. So if they have all of the relevant information at hand, we sometimes just have to assume that people will make their own decisions and they're ultimately they're responsible for their own welfare um, with respect to that particular decision. But the thing that we can really do that will mess that up is to withhold information. And so in a situation where we're going to defer and let someone else make the decision on their own, we really should uh, practice full disclosure so that they can make an informed decision. Uh, so we don't withhold key pieces of information to steer their, their decisions in a particular direction. Instead, we give them all the information and say, look, it's up to you. Uh, you make your own decision now. So that's, that's uh, I think, a good principle to, to remember um, in all contexts. <clears throat> Another one is possibly the golden rule. You know, just think about it. Uh, think about your actions in the context of doing to others as you would have them do to you. So don't do something um, if you wouldn't want to have that same thing done to you. Of course, this doesn't always work. An obvious pitfall would be you discover that your coworker um, is doing a poor job on a particular project, but you decide, oh, well, I'm not going to write them out. I'm not going to uh, make sure this bad design gets fixed because I wouldn't want them to do that to me. Well, that's clearly not the ethical outcome, particularly if the bad work being done by that coworker actually has um, serious implications on the safety or financial profitability or any other uh, attribute of of the work that that person is doing. Uh, another thing to think about is what's called the New York Times test. Um, you know, if you're engaging in activities and doing work that you know you think might end up on the cover of the New York Times if it comes out into the open, maybe you should be thinking a little bit more carefully about whether that's something you want to engage in or not. So, you know, is the work that you're doing something that you would want to read about on the front page of the New York Times next week, and not? not on the front page in a good sense, in a laudatory sense, but in a scandalous sense. Uh, and if the work that you're doing falls into that category, or the decisions that you're making fall into that category, then you should proceed very carefully on that front. And finally, we'll talk about this uh, analysis process that we can use as a tool, again, to help um, identify and perhaps trade off and find the best net outcome if we have a set of conflicting ethical principles that we're dealing with. Uh, that will lead to the best net outcome or will lead to the least violation of the rights of persons. Uh, um, as a result of the action that we undertake. So let's talk about this, this utilitarian analysis, or it's also sometimes called a rights of persons analysis. Uh, these two are really very similar, except one is focused on um, a rights-based analysis. If you're going to do something, it's going to affect someone's right to such and such, um, but it could have also affect some other right of some other person to such and such, and so you have to trade off these rights against each other. Or from the utilitarian perspective, you can sort of place weights and effects, assign weights and effects to all outcomes in your decision process, and then consider the sum of all the weights and choose the, choose the one with the best outcome. So the procedure really is uh, you identify all those individuals or entities that are going to be affected by a particular ethical decision that you're trying to make. Um, and you have to then weight the effects on all the stakeholders for each possible outcome that you might reach. Uh, and then consider some of these weights and, and then use that as a way of guiding you towards choosing the best outcome. Now, unfortunately, this is not an algorithm. It's not going to give you the right answer. Uh, it may even lead you down the wrong path, potentially. It's really uh, just another tool that allows you to critically analyze and carefully and introspectively think about the situation that you're facing, rather than simply rushing to a gut-level decision. Uh, and some of the problems that, that arise here are, you know, if you have intangible benefits or intangible um, negative effects, how do you weight those? 
Um, how do you weight the effects on one person versus another person? It's hard to say how important a particular effect might be on different individuals. And what about these rights of persons? How do you uh, place relative values on them? So you have to be very careful about staring at a number and saying, oh, well, look at this number. This number is greater than that number. Therefore, this must be the right answer. No. Uh, we're really in, a, in the realm of uh, unquantifiable quantities here that um, are very difficult to, to analyze to that extent, to that quantitative extent. Uh, so we have to be careful about applying this kind of analysis uh, to ethical situations. We have to use it really carefully and judiciously just as a tool for analysis that might help you find potentially an alternative solution or outcome that is maybe one that you hadn't thought of um, up front that might be some sort of compromise that ends up um, sort of minimizing the, the negatives and maximizing the positives of that situation. Let's go through a couple of example scenarios uh, just to help make all of this mumbo jumbo a little bit more com concrete and clear. So this is a pretty pretty straightforward one that's pretty relevant to the topical material we've been covering in this course. So let's say um, you're working for a company that's developed a new USB device that plugs into people's computers. Uh, it's a webcam in this case and you're responsible for, for uh, writing a device driver, a piece of the operating system that actually interfaces at a low level to that I.O. device. You've been working on it for a while, um, and while testing it, you find that you know on Windows it crashes, causes Windows to crash unpredictably about once a week. So it'll typically run for about a week before it causes any problems. Uh, now you're under a lot of pressure from your manager. You got to get this device driver out the door because it's you know the only revenue product that your company has, and if you can't, if you don't start shipping it soon, your company might go out of business. So what should you do? Should you go ahead and release? this device with this device driver that doesn't quite work 100% of the time. If you do release it, what kinds of warning labels should you put on it? Um, and who is affected and how by the decisions that you make in this process? How do you even begin to think about this? So let's step back and think about our analysis approach and say, okay, first of all, let's identify the stakeholders in this situation. And I can think of at least four categories. So first of all, the company which may have shareholders who've invested in it. They're obviously concerned about profitability in the short term. They want to get a product out the door so some revenue starts coming in. But there's also a long-term issue here. If you ship a defective product, uh, that might kill the long-term prospects of your company. If enough customers are, are affected negatively by this, uh, your company may, may end up folding if the, if the product is too shoddy. There's also the customers. Um, there may be some customers out there that have a critical or urgent need for this particular device. Um, so, um, you know, maybe it's actually important for them that you get this out. They've been waiting for this. You've promised them this device, and uh, they really need it. And if they don't get it soon, then whatever they're trying to sell, maybe it's a service that they're selling, or maybe it's another product that integrates your product into it, um, they're going to be delayed and they're going to be in trouble. Um, so maybe there's an issue there. On the other hand, the customers who are actually end users of this device might face safety issues. If they rely on this particular computer that they connect this webcam to to um, perform some safety critical task, uh, what's going to happen if you crash their computer once a week? Potentially very bad things could happen. So you have to, to take those into consideration as well. There are also third parties. You know, maybe your customers are using these in applications that you haven't really potentially envisioned. You know, what if somebody is actually going to incorporate this um, into their ATM as a security camera? So their ATM runs Windows. The ATM needs to have a security camera to film, create a record of everybody who uses the ATM. They're going to use your USB webcam in this product. Now uh, the ATM is going to crash once a week as a result of your USB webcam's device driver being flaky. What does that mean? What are the implications of that? Well, if the, if the ATM crashes in a way that no one can use it anymore and can, no one can get any more cash out of it, maybe that's okay. That's mostly an inconvenience to anybody that might want to use that ATM. However, it could potentially crash in a way that uh, it's now handing out cash to whoever asks for it. And so there's a financial loss now for the bank that's using that ATM and so on. So there might be all kinds of scenarios that might arise um, based on the different kinds of usages that customers will actually put your device to. So you have to be, again, aware of these things. You have to think about them before you can really make an informed decision about, about how to proceed.
finally, of course, you and your dependents are always involved because um, not getting this product out in a timely way might affect your, your employment, your income. Um, if you actually ship a defective product, there could even be legal liability issues that might come back to hurt you and your family later on down the road. So you can imagine that a fairly simple scenario here that seems pretty straightforward actually from an ethical perspective can get pretty complicated even just from the perspective of trying to identify you know who are the individuals that are affected or the entities that are affected how are they affected what again are the ethical principles that we're going to be running into here um, that we have to that we have to trade off against each other and figure out what is the right thing to do next we have a real example this is kind of a sad story um, the Therac 25 uh, was a radiation therapy machine that was in use from um, 1982 on. Uh, it was a machine that was developed in France. Uh, so this was obviously used for, for cancer treatment to provide radiation therapy to try to kill cancer cells. Um, it was the first device of its kind that was software computer controlled. Um, it had very few safety interlocks directly built into the hardware. It was assumed that all of these safety interlocks would be in the software itself. Uh, now it turned out that um, the software that was written for this device had many design errors in it and many safety mechanism failures in it. One of them coincidentally was related to arithmetic overflow which we studied earlier in this course and that overflow condition actually disabled the safety interlock and would allow dangerous levels of radiation dosages to be applied to patients. Um, Ultimately, this led to at least six radiation overdoses. Three patients died as a result of these uh, failures. And the conclusions that came out of the study that was done to understand what went wrong were that the company had really um, applied insufficient resources to developing the software for this machine. They really just had one programmer and one engineer working on it. Uh, there was insufficient testing of that software. There was inappropriate reuse of previous generation control software. So there was a previous generation machine that actually had hardware safety interlocks in it. So the control software didn't enforce those safety interlocks. Uh, they just simply used pieces of that old control software in the new generation hardware. The new generation hardware didn't have any safety mechanisms built into it. And so uh, these disastrous, uh, disastrous overdoses of radiation became possible. Um, also, there were problems on the management front initially. The company denied any problems. They had reacted very slowly to reports of problems. And so, um, you know, many more patients were exposed to these problems before they were uh, eventually fixed. So again, this is a concrete example of somebody writing software um, and making some very serious mistakes and not being very thoughtful, not being very thorough, not being very careful. And uh, ultimately, people died as a result of this carelessness. So this should be a, a reminder here of the potential for severe, uh, severe consequences if, if, we don't, um, if we don't conduct ourselves in our professional lives in a way that, uh, that uh, in a careful, thoughtful, ethical way that we should, that we should conduct ourselves. This final example here has to do with uh, something that uh, came up just a few years ago. So uh, hopefully um, most of you are familiar with the Tiananmen Square Massacre, which happened in Beijing in China in 1987. Uh, this was a protest that happened um, at the, in this public square where the uh, Chinese government set in the red, sent in the Red Army uh, tanks and everything to basically um, Quell, quenched this protest and uh, a bunch of people died as a result and as you can see in some of the pictures on this web page if you do a, a Google image search um, for Tiananmen Square Massacre these are the kinds of pictures uh, that that turn up um, so you see the tanks you see people being beaten down and, and so on now the interesting thing is that if you actually do the same search if you search for Tiananmen Square um, on the Chinese version of the Google image search site, images.google.cn. This is the site that's accessible within China, or at the time, back in 2006, uh, was accessible in China. Um, instead of seeing pictures of protesters being beaten down and, and tanks and so on and soldiers, um, this is what you get. You basically get a collection of people's tourist photos from Tiananmen Square. Um, and so if we zoom in on that, you can see those a little bit more closely again. So these are all very peaceful and happy and uh, wonderful 
wonderful pictures. No, no clue that uh, anything bad had ever happened in Tiananmen Square. So how can this be? How can it be that um, the same company implements a, an image search and uh, the images that come up are so drastically different depending on whether you're doing the search within China or whether you're doing the search within the US? Well, the only way that this could have happened is by design. Uh, so somebody at Google and Google's management chain made the decision that this was the right thing to do was to censor these images that the Chinese government, for obvious reasons, didn't want to be visible to residents of China who are doing Google searches for Tiananmen Square. They basically want to erase this event uh, from their memory. They don't want people to, to know about it. Um, obviously, Google had to collaborate and agree with the Chinese government in, in terms of implementing this censorship. Now imagine that you, sitting in your cubicle at Google, you just got this great job, you're happy to be working at this very successful uh, startup company and your manager walks up to you and says hey look we just decided to um, enable image search in China and uh, by the way the government has told us that we can't make these particular images available so you're going to be now writing some code to make sure that anybody that searches for Tiananmen Square within China is actually going to get a different set of results from people who search for it outside of China. Ethical situation what would you do? Are you comfortable with this? Are you comfortable with this censorship? Um, would you go ahead and do that? Would you resign in protest? You'd be so upset that you'd quit your job. Would you go ahead and do it, but you would leak the information to the press so that there'd be an uproar, as there was when this, when this was leaked? Or would you follow some alternative path? So let's think about this. If you make this decision, who's going to be affected by your decision, and how are they going to be affected by it? Well, obviously, Google itself will be affected. Uh, and shareholders, investors in Google will be affected because obviously Google wants to be in China because there's profits to be made. It's a huge market um, and they don't want to be shut out of that market. Uh, you obviously will be affected as well, you and your dependents, because if you refuse to do this you'll probably get fired and you'll lose your employment, you'll lose your income. Uh, but on the other hand there's also Google users in China. Um, if this censorship gets, if you implement the censorship feature they're going to be deprived of the true history of the events of Tiananmen Square. They'll never find out what exactly what actually happened. You'll be helping um, a totalitarian government repress this uh, piece of their of their history. On the flip side, um, if you decide to protest and decide that you're not going to follow through on the censorship task, uh, probably what will happen is the Chinese government will say to Google, "Well, we're not going to allow you any access to our market then," and any internet user then in China will be deprived of any access to Google. Now this obviously has negative consequences as well. And in fact I think this, I believe this was the main justification that Google used at the time to actually allow this kind of censorship to occur was that the net benefit of providing Chinese users with access to Google outweighed the net negative of censoring a small part of the history of China in those search results. Um, so again, it gets pretty complicated. There's positives and there's negatives. And how do you decide what to do? What is the right thing to do? What would you do? I can't tell you the right answer. If I had been presented with this situation, I honestly can't tell you what I would have done. It's never that simple. It's, it's never that, that black and white and that straightforward. Okay, hopefully this lecture has stimulated your thinking to some extent. Um, if you've never thought about ethics in the context of engineering before, hopefully you have now. If you've thought about it before, hopefully you've learned a few new things or new ways to think about it. So again, engineering ethics is really uh, dealing with right and wrong moral issues, ethical issues with respect to engineering practice. This is an issue that you will encounter uh, in your job at some point. It's unavoidable. Some of the things that are useful to do when you're trying to analyze a situation are to differentiate between the factual elements, the conceptual elements, and the moral slash ethical elements of the situation that you're facing. Um, the moral principles that you're going to use uh, to help make your decisions are going to help you detect when something smells, when there's something happening in your company that just uh, isn't right, doesn't feel right. Um, and if you have a clear idea of what your moral principles are, you'll be able to use them to guide your decision making in a way that uh, you'll be able to live with and sleep at night with. Um, if there are more than one 
ethical principle that's, a, that's relevant. You have to do some analysis of the conflicting principles. You can try to identify, first identify the ones that are relevant, that are affected, and then try to consider the direct and indirect effects of your professional decisions and actions on all of those individuals or entities that might be affected by those decisions. And the bottom line, again, to repeat myself, is that sometimes there are no easy answers. Um, oftentimes we can come to a conclusion that we're happy with, but uh, sometimes some situations are just morally ambivalent and, and we have to kind of do the thing that we're comfortable with. And there, there really is no straightforward easy answer um, to lots of these scenarios.